handsome football player doing with her? That weird girl from the other part of town. Or, really? Does that nerd even think he has a chance with a cheerleader homecoming queen? Come on. Okay, if we don't remember thinking it, or we just don't want to admit to our own shallowness, we certainly have seen it played up on the large screen in just about every teen movie, from Revenge of the Nerds to Pretty in Pink, High School Musical, Grease, Grease 2, one of my favorites, <laughs> and, and even movies like My Fair Lady. It starts young, kids on the playground telling other kids that they can't play with them. And I don't know when it stops. I remember in the end of sixth grade, I had just moved to a new school, and these two girls took me aside to make sure I knew that I was not cool enough to eat lunch with them anymore. And then they shoved me just for added insult. The thing was, I hadn't been eating with them for about a week because I didn't like how they were treating other people. I think they just wanted to make it clear that they decided I wasn't eating with them. I'd like to think that we grow out of this, but I don't know when we do. And it happens in colleges especially Rush Week with sororities and fraternities. We see it in the workplace. There's sales staff against the warehouse crew or different apartments or different floors of the office building. At the park, breastfeeding mothers against those who use formula. Ford versus Toyota, Giants versus Dodgers. Who is allowed to get married? Who can use what bathroom? Republicans against Democrats. Who that God has called may be ordained? Organic versus GMO. I hear it still happens in many retirement communities with able-bodied persons feeling superior to those in wheelchairs. I mean, isn't it time to grow up? <laughs> and I know it still happens in many churches. With who is really welcome and who is welcome to the table for communion, where Jesus is the host and I am not a bouncer. Who does God love? Who doesn't God love? Different groups of people finding reasons that may have nothing to do with what anyone has control over or any choice or they may just not understand to look at another group and say, ew. And then they make it clear that the other group should not share their same space or rights. Well, in today's gospel, there is a lot of should and should not, a lot of ewing going on. Just before we begin reading in Luke, Jesus has basically called out the crowds on the way they are labeling him as a glutton and a drunk of friends, of tax collectors, and sinners. I'm not sure if they're jealous or what it is, but they are looking at who Jesus is associating with, who he is spending time with. They're saying, ew, what's wrong with him? And then there's this Pharisee named Simon who invites Jesus over for a meal. And even though Simon is a Pharisee, Jesus goes. 
Now, we don't know much about Simon. We don't know if he is intrigued by Jesus, if he's one of the few Pharisees who were supporters, or maybe he was hoping that Jesus would do some of his you know, parlor tricks and heal someone so he'd have a good story to tell, or if he was an enemy trying to entrap him. Friend or foe, we don't know. But we do know that he was watching Jesus meticulously. Judging every movement. I think we've probably all felt this way from time to time. Where we know we're being checked out. Where we know that someone is just not sure and waiting for us to slip up. Maybe at auditions or tryouts or job interview. The first time meeting future in-laws. Or the first time being a woman pastor someone meets. And so we might know what Jesus was kind of feeling as he was reclining there and all eyes were upon him. And then this woman comes in, uninvited. But she seems to know Jesus like they've met before. And if we look at the verb tenses, we're led to believe that maybe she and Jesus had had a meaningful conversation previously in which he absolved her from her past. And so now her tears are flowing. And she feels compelled to serve Jesus with all that she has. To, to return some of the love and grace that she has received. And this woman whose name we don't know breaks all sorts of cultural taboos. Like crossing to the other side of the tracks. Like a nerd trying out for the cheer squad. Or, or a band geek trying to sit at a table with all the jocks. Or, or a young private wandering into the officer's club. And she ignores what is considered appropriate and she touches a man's feet. And then she takes down her hair in public and wipes his feet with her tears and her hair. So grateful that whatever sin it was that she was known for, whether it was taking the Lord's name in vain or corporate espionage, had been wiped and all Simon could do was to think, Ew! Why is he letting her touch, her, touch him? When is she getting out of my house? Ew. Well, nowadays, we have all been this woman. We have all felt at one point, like we were the outsider, the other. Whether it was that we were too young or too old, too white or too dark, the only one at a wedding without a date, the only one at a reunion without a job, the only one with our past, the only one who felt totally different. And we've known it when others have looked at us and said, ew. And we know what it's like to not be invited to the party or to be uninvited to lunch or to come up to the table and the empty seat apparently is being saved, not for us. There's no room. Luke tells us that 
Jesus reminds this woman that she has been forgiven. And because of her faith that he can do that, which in itself is scandalous, because only God can forgive sin. So if she believes that Jesus can forgive her sin, then she's believing that he is God. And because of that faith, she believes that she is welcome and worthy and wanted in Jesus' presence. And just as Jesus has welcomed this woman, Jesus pulls up a chair for us and invites us to the table where we are filled with love and grace. And we are made to feel worthy and whole on the inside. And we just look at Simon and just shake our head at how he just didn't get it. And then we judge him for the way he ewed her. And, and how Simon just doesn't understand God's love the way we do. And then we realize that while we are this woman, we are also Simon. Ewing at Simon. We are the ewed and we are the ewers. Trapped in a vicious cycle. And so this is where we embrace what Paul wrote to the Galatians. That if judgment comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. And we give thanks for this undeserved, unearned grace. Because without it, we are nothing. But we are something. We are saints and we are sinners. We have ewed and Christ changes us and redeems us and forgives us. We have been ewed at, and Christ brings us healing and makes us whole. We are invited to the table, just as we are. And when we arrive, we are changed and transformed and given new eyes to see that in Christ there is no other there is no healing, but there is an open seat where all are welcome and worthy and wanted. Amen.